Hi everyone, welcome. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Welcome back to class and welcome to The Power of a Voice, How Artists and Organizations Speak Up for Justice. Uh, I'm Raymond Patton. I'm the faculty director of the Honors Program for those of you who don't know me. As those of you who are in class here every week know, uh, we meet many of us here uh, in person, many of us remotely, and then also today for our special event, we have a live audience uh, watching over Facebook at the New York Philharmonic's live feed. Um, so welcome to all of you here and welcome to all of you out there. Um, so today we're gonna continue the conversation we've had about justice and how your lives intersect with justice. Um, that's a topic we've been talking about all semester. Today, though, we're going to have a unique opportunity to hear about what the arts can say on behalf of justice and how organizations like the New York Philharmonic, uh, who has graciously joined us co-hosting this event today, um, and some of the organizations, you'll, other organizations you'll hear about today, how they can play a role in advocating for justice. Uh, and this is something I know many of you are looking to do in your own lives, and I hope you can draw inspiration from uh, our fabulous panelists. Some questions I'd encourage you to think about as you're, you're hearing uh, from our panelists. One, what is the unique contribution that the arts make to the struggle for justice? Two, how have all the individuals here positioned themselves in their organizations to contribute to just causes? And how do they lend their unique voices to that work? Um, and I hope that's something you can take into your consideration as you think about your own lives and your own uh, causes of justice that matter to you. Um, so since we want to make sure that we don't distract from uh, our attention on our panelists, we ask that you hold your questions to the end. Uh, those of you in the live audience have index cards. If you have questions, feel free to write them down on the index cards and we'll collect them to ask the panelists at the end. Those of you uh, attending remotely, you can put your questions uh, into the chat and then our moderators will pass those on to uh, the panelists during the question and answer period. Um, finally, I want to thank all of the people who, who have made this possible. First and foremost, to our wonderful panelists who have made this event possible with, with your own lives and your own work. Uh, also, with, with the New York, for the New York Philharmonic, uh, all of our wonderful colleagues there, and particularly Gary Padmore, who spearheaded this. Thank you, Gary. Curate John Jay, Dean Dara Byrne, uh, Ms. Alana Phillip, our, our colleagues uh, in, in tech and video services. Thank you. This would not be possible with, without all of you. Um, and to kick us off, uh, I'd like to invite Ian Manuel to take the mic and to share, share the work that you have created. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when I was 13 years old, I was sentenced to the rest of my life in the Florida Department of Corrections. Uh, it was based on a Florida law that says a child of any age that's indicted for a life or death felony shall be treated in every respect as if he were an adult. Now, I don't have time to give you the full uh, presentation, but I do want to let you know that had it not been for Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative, I would have died in prison. Um, you guys might be familiar with Brian's work from the book, Just Mercy. Uh, he spoke to me in that book. He exposed my poetry to the world in that book uh, for the first time. I distinctly remember Brian writing me and asking for permission to share my poem, Unquiet Tears, uh, with, the, with, the, with the world. And I couldn't believe this guy that had taken my case for free pro bono was asking me for permission to use my poetry. Uh, I believe that, you know, the arts are very instrumental in, 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 in the criminal justice system because had it not been for the arts, I would not have been able to survive what I endured uh, for 26 years of my incarceration because at the age of 15, I was placed in long-term solitary confinement. And I would stay there from 1992 to 2010, 18 consecutive years. And I turned to a gift that I didn't know I had to survive and sustain my, myself doing my uh, stay in solitary confinement. It was the gift of poetry. Someone sent me two boxes of curves book, The Rose That Grew From Concrete. 
and I began rewriting Tupac poems and sharing them with my fellow Christians. And um, next thing you know, they, they began paying me to write their girlfriends and their wives' poems. And so that's when I knew I had a gift because at any time you get a person to pay you to do anything, um, you uh, actually uh, sign, they're, they're worse than Simon Cowell. <laughs> they're worse than Simon Cowell and they're worse than uh, Sam and on Apollo, to be honest with you. Uh, they're tough to please. So I knew if I could make it there, I could make it out here. Um, but something happened after the United States Supreme Court overturned all juvenile life sentences with Graham versus uh, the state of Florida. I went back to the court thinking I was going home. I, I'll never forget hearing that 5 4 decision, listening to a small AM FM transistor radio in solitary confinement that I shouldn't have had. Um, but someone had snuck to me, and I, I remember it coming on, and it said, in a final court decision, the United States Supreme Court has overturned all life sentences for juveniles. And I'm like, what? What What, what did they say? And then they went on to the next thing. And I had to wait 30 agonizing minutes to hear it again. And this time, it was a 6 3 decision, but still in my favor. And I thought I was going home. And I went back to court, and... The judge said something before he went into the chambers to deliberate to let me know that I wasn't going home. He said that was a statement made in this courtroom about rehabilitation. But in 1990, when Mr. Manuel's crime happened, the legislative intent was to punish, not rehabilitate. So he went into his chambers, he deliberated. I, I don't know what he was doing in those chambers, actually. But when he came back, he looked me in the eyes and he said, Mr. Man, your state's want, the state wants me to give you 75 years when they consecutive and place your life sentence. I'm not going to do that. I don't know if the United States Supreme Court would agree with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sentence you to 65 years in place of your life sentence, followed by 10 years probation. Um, I was distraught. I was hurting because uh, I, I thought I was going home. But I'm not an anomaly. All across the United States, uh, kids are being resentenced to astronomical numbers because just because the United States Supreme Court says you can no longer be sentenced to L-I-F-E, judges are sentencing kids to term of year sentences that still equal life, 60, 70, 100. I've seen one case where a kid was actually resentenced to 200 years and said it didn't violate the U.S. Constitution. Eighth Amendment of uh, uh, cruel and unusual punishment. But when I went back to my cell uh, and was sent back to prison, I turned to my gift. Poetry became like a, 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 a my therapy. It became a way for me to express myself. And so I like to share the poem that I wrote after the judge who sentenced me to 65 years. And it's actually the title of my, my book uh, that Random House published called My Time Will Come. And it says, I promise you, the brunt of my oppression has a purpose. And the same person that you persecute will one day be worshipped. Though I stand before you bare-chested and shirtless with my soul and emotions naked, just wanting to be nurtured. Yeah, despite the desperation, desertion, and hurt, my time going to come. The one who composed this poem, not knowing if I'll ever be able to perform it in an auditorium, I do it with the faith of a poet that believes he was born to do it like an acorn caught up in a storm, flung from the branch where it was born. You can only hold me back for so long. My time going to come. Despite the difficulties and disappointments, my determination remains undaunted. Though the waters of my tomorrows are deep and uncharted, the buoyance of my character will float away from reforms like a song written yet unrecorded. My time will come. Though you wrap me in chains and spray me with chemical flames and did all of the things you did to add to my pain, my circumstances will change. I believe this with the death of my being, that as long as this world continues to spin, it cannot end. 
till it's been enjoyed by him. Remember this thing. Because things won't always be this way. My time will come. My time will come. Against all conceivable odds. My time will come. Thank you. You get my cards. <laughs> Ian, that was incredible <laughs> and powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I can take this down. How y'all doing? Good. How y'all doing? Good. Are there people here? <laughs> Hello, it is so wonderful to be here. My name is Robin Walker Murphy. I'm the executive director of an organization called Groundswell. Uh, we are a public art organization that brings together youth, artists, and community members to create works of public art that hopefully inspire dialogue and social change. And it is such a pleasure to be here to talk about the ways in which art can move forward social change. And so Ian, thank you again for kicking us off. And I think it's just really interesting how your story um, is why so many of us do this work and why so many of us use the arts to propel these stories forward. And I'm really excited to learn more from both Anthony and Anthony. <laughs> about their piece that they're premiering next week um, uh, around the American cryptic at the Lincoln Center. Um, the piece is, You Have the Right to Remain Silent. So to my left, skipping over the amazing Ian, we have Anthony Miguel. Anthony joined the Philharmonic as a principal clarinet, playing the principal clarinet, and in 19, 2014 became the first African-American principal player. Um, he is the recipient of the 2020 Avery Fisher Prize, one of classical music's most significant awards given to musicians who represent the highest level of musical excellence. And I love that you're an advocate for music education to reach underserved communities for addressing issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in classical music. And Anthony also performed at the inauguration of Barack, President Barack Obama, which is just really amazing. And also has worked with your And then we have, we have a Pulitzer Prize winner in the house, in case you all know, a Pulitzer Prize winner, Anthony Davis is an American pianist and composer. He incorporates several styles, including jazz, rhythm and blues, gospel, non-Western, African, and experimental music. He has played with several groups and also is a professor at the University of California, San Diego. He is perhaps best known for his operas, and he has been called the Dean of African American Opera Composers. Um, he has been known to, he composed um, X, the Life and Times of Malcolm X, which I am just, I can't wait to hear more about that because I love Malcolm X, so I'm just really hyped for you to talk about that. And um, which premiered at the New York City Opera in 1986. Amistad was premiered with the Lyric Opera of Chicago in 1997, and Wakanda's Dream was premiered at the Opera Omaha in 2007. His opera, The Central Park Five, premiered June 15, 2019 at the Long Beach Opera Company in California. It won him a Pulitzer Prize for Music in uh, May 4th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much for the dream. So, Ian, I did a little research, and what I found, and this is something I also want to speak to um, Anthony's about, <laughs> is you were in solitary confinement for 18 consecutive years. Yeah. And the spark, from what I understood, if I got this right, is you were taken out of your cell and they thought they were going to punish you all by making you watch PBS. Mm -hmm. And that punishment actually was a catalyst for your art. Can you talk a little bit about that? So, yeah. Um, I had only been exposed to academic academic style type of poetry, the kind of poetry that you see on the page. Mm -hmm. um, 
And yes, in fact, in prison, they use PBS as a punishment um, because prisoners like to watch sports and entertainment. And um, so while the program didn't actually compel me to write poetry, what it did was change uh, the type of title poetry I wrote. I had never been exposed to spoken word poetry before. I had only been exposed to, uh, like I was saying, academic poetry. Uh, you know, Robert Frost is the uh, uh, Maya Angelou and, and things like that, Langston Hughes. But they took me out of my cell to watch this uh, documentary. Well, they put it on PBS. They didn't know what was going to be on there. And it was this uh, documentary called To Be Heard. And it was about three South Bronx teenagers who learned to uh, express their storytelling through spoken word poetry. And I couldn't wait to get back in my cell. I was like, I was so engrossed and engaged in this. And I couldn't wait to get back in my cell to, to try to capture what I had seen on screen and put it on paper. And I went back to the to my cell and I wrote the poem uh, that I use, usually close all my presentations with called uh, Every Time I Breathe. It's, it's uh, such a powerful poem. And, and yeah, it, it, what they use as a punishment ended up being something that far, that became a pleasure for me and to share my gift with the world. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anthony McGill, can you talk a little bit about your journey to classical music? Like, was it something that you heard in your home? Was it something that was just around you? Like, how did you get here? Yeah, um, I just want to say um, it's such an honor to be sitting right here. And in my life, music has given me the opportunity to be surrounded by, by very special people, powerful people, strong people. And early on in my life, with my parents, my parents were both uh, visual artists, but um, they they met in a teacher's college growing up, and um, my dad in Mississippi and my mom uh, in Chicago, grew up in Chicago, and then in Chicago. And so we were surrounded by the concept um, that you could change your life, you could save your life through arts education, through music education, through a well-rounded education. So that was their thing with my brother and I, that so we grew up on the south side of Chicago. And at any point, my parents were trying to help us make good decisions in our life. And they knew that exposure to, to arts could save us, could, could change our lives for the better. And so that's how we started. My brother and I started um, started playing music. And that gave, us my, gave me the opportunity to be sitting here with you. And um, that, that is something that I'll, I'll never forget. But... You know, we were surrounded by a community of people on the South Side that, that where classical music wasn't wasn't the primary focus, right? But we discovered the love of music through teachers and mentors in our community that um, were some of the earliest Black pioneers in classical music, in particular. But really, we were surrounded by just by musicians. By a musician. One of my first clarinet teachers was a jazz saxophone player in Chicago. Come over to the house and and give us, um, give me lessons. And then I just discovered this world. Um, but when we started off, it was a, that was a very, I came from a very different world than, than the world of classical music, but it gave me opportunities um, out of my community that um, I could have only dreamt of. And um, so that's a little bit of my story. I want to take too much time. But, um, and thank you for your art. And thank you for giving your art to the world. Because that's, that's what it is, it's about, Giving giving power to people that um, can can be voices that we don't hear from. And that's what the arts can do to change. So it doesn't doesn't matter where it comes from. It just matters. It comes from your heart. It gives people strength, and that's really important. So um, anyway, I'll pass pass the mic. No, that was, that was great. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Can you talk a little bit about your role to becoming a composer? Yeah, I, I, I had a long road to be a composer. Uh, I think for me, music in the beginning was an escape, a way of escaping all the tensions and stuff that were around me in school. You know, I would just come home and, and, and play the piano, and that seemed to I, it made me feel better. And 
Uh, in fact, my parents had to kick me off the piano game because I wanted to play all the time. So, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and so music was, it was very encouraged. My father, it turns out, was a, a musician before, and then he decided, he, he, he eventually decided to go in the direction of uh, becoming a professor of literature, et cetera. But before, I, I didn't know until my father's death how deep his connection to music was, which was kind of ironic because when my father died, um, uh, Raphael Gidier, who is the um, violist for the Juilliard String Quartet, came to my father's funeral and he said, told me that my father was an incredible violinist and that he used to play together all the time. And, and, uh, and I never heard my father play the violin. And he, I always heard him play the piano. He could play lists, you know, he could play. <laughs> I mean, he, could, he was a really good pianist, you know, for, as an amateur pianist, but I, didn't, but I didn't realize that wasn't even, that was his second instrument. By the time I was born, he had given up the violin because it was so frustrating to me being, being an African American in 1939 and being a classical violinist mm -hmm. and trying to make to make a to you know try to create a career. At that point, he thought it was impossible. So he, he was very excited when I when I decided to became more and more uh, involved in music. And then when I you know I started to 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 at the same time I started. To, when I, when I started to play jazz was when I was in 10th grade. And I'd only been a classical kid since I you know, was a little kid. And um, and at the same time, I started to compose. And both both those things kind of started at the same time. And um, and I was, I'm, I'm, I was happy that my father got to hear some of my music, you know, at least the beginning of it, you know, at, at before he passed on. So, um, so you know, but but I but I feel that I you know I that I always had a, my my parents support and that they understood that that music was important being an important release and important way also way for me to deal with all this all the stress and tension that was around me. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about the liberatory or the potential liberatory power of the humanities, arts and humanities. You all haven't read the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, please do soon. Um, so there's one part in the book where he talks about, you know, when he learned to read. And when he, when he learned to read, he could no longer be enslaved. Like there was something that kind of clicked. When he learned to read, and the next thing you know, he like turned the whip around the person who was enslaved to him and like whipped him. Right? That was like the 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 fear of having you know black people you know know like how to read. Is there a moment like that for any of you when the arts, when the humanities has clicked for you and shifted something inside of you that could not go back to who you were before? Yeah, um, there's so many transformational moments like that in my life. Um, the first time someone paid me to write a poem, uh, I was shocked. Like, like you really paid me to for this, you know? <laughs> um, but it, it let me know. Like, I, it is my belief that God gives each and every one of us a gift. My gift just happens to be the ability to compose words in ways that move me. Um, I remember one day after President Barack Obama won the election, I wrote a poem, a, a poetic speech called Yes, We Did. And in prison, you have to, and at least the person I was in at this time, in order to be heard, I had to get down on the lay on the floor and seek under the door um, so the other prisoners could hear me. And so I'm laying flat on the floor and I'm reciting this poem called Yes, We Did. And I just distinctively remember... Uh, the officer that was sitting in the bar downstairs at the at the table, uh, waiting to the end of the point, and then running up the stairs and come banging on my door, and he was like, "Ian, no, actually, they call you by they address you by your last name in prison. Manual, manual, man, let me get that. Wow. Let me get that. I'm like, let you get what? <laughs> let you get what?" And he like, oh man, let me get that speech you just wrote, man. I I, I have a blog, and, and I want to put it on my blog, man. And and, and I promise to give you your credit. Wow. But I'm looking at how he's acting and how he's responding to my words, and I'm like, he's making me nervous. Like, 
like I, I felt like he was gonna steal it from me mm-hmm. and make it his make it his own. So I was like, nah. And he was a cool officer. He was cooler than though, like some of the rest of the officers, mm-hmm. you know, that used to beat you and gas you and harm you and torture you. Uh, he was one of the better ones, but I still didn't trust him to give him my art. That's that was the part of me that that came from the universe. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the transformational moment for me. Uh, just knowing that I had something of uh, value to offer the world. That came from yourself that somebody wanted to, right. to also share with and It's liberating. It's, right. it's a freedom that because when you're in prison, they try to make you, uh, they try to strip you of your identity. Mm-hmm. They make everybody got the same haircut. Everybody wear the same clothes. Uh, everybody's just toe the line. And, and particularly in solitary confinement, you know, where you're stripped of everything, of, sometimes even your mattress, and your box is sometimes just naked. And so to be able to hold on to your identity in, in that way, poetry was the way that I was able to hold on and, and remind myself as well as others that I had something of value to offer the world. Thank you. Mr. McGill, Mr. Davis, you want to respond to that at all? Yeah, I think, um, you know, first of all, I think I just wanted to thank John Jay again for this as well, because, um, Ironically, um, I got to meet Brian Stevenson in this building too. Really? Uh, yeah. And um, so to be sitting here is very, very straight for me. But you know what? I, you know what I see in, in your story and in a lot of our stories is something that music and art can give one, and that is hope. That is hope in the face of despair. So a lot of times, and you talk, you speak of freedom, right? Um, a lot of times you can you can be trapped in a prison of your own mind as well, even if you don't have bars around you, especially in certain neighborhoods, like the neighborhood I grew up in. And uh, music and art um, gave gave me the capacity to see beyond the the segregated bars of the community that I grew up in, and that's that's a very powerful thing because you can imagine something else out of your situation and no one knows that better than Mr. Manuel here. And um, I think that's a powerful tool that all kids in the world, all kids in America, in some of these places, um, and people can relate to that. What music and art gives, language, poetry gives, is this type of freedom, this freedom out of the space of your own mind for you to travel into other places, um, uh, spiritually, mentally, and physically, eventually. And that's a, that's a very, very powerful force. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Mr. Davis, was there a moment for you where you had this liberating experience through your art that shifted you in some way? Well, I think uh, for me, it was it's having you know, some you know, great people and great mentors. You know, early on, I, I remember when I was a freshman in college, and uh, Duke Ellington came to my school. And, uh, you know, Duke Ellington, I thought it was a reception, and I was I was really shy. I was really shy, so I was all the way on the other side of the room. I had a huge afro, so I, I would give I would give Angela Davis a run for the money. <laughs> and and so so Ellington was on the other side of the room. And he pointed to me, well, well, at this point, you must be a musician. He said, let's come over here. So, so I did. So I did. And, and so I had this whole conversation with, with Duke Ellington. You know, just he just had that vibe. He said, you must be a musician. And for me, I mean, at that point in my life, I had, I had decided that was my path. You know, that was, that was something I was, you know, thinking. I, I was doing music all the time. I didn't, you know, I was worried that, you know, I wasn't. I, I wasn't focused on other things. I was focusing on that. So then he said, you must be a musician. So I said, Duke Ellington said, so I guess. Well, I can't tell you anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, later when I first did my first record recording in New York, when I was, I, I was playing on a record with Marion Brown and Reggie Workman was the bass player on the recording. And so he decided I was this young guy, kid coming into the city for the first time to play play music. He said, Man, I gotta show you the city. So after the session, he took me up to Harlem. And he said, Oh, this is this is what you know, 
Big Nicholas used to play, and Coltrane played here, and such and such. This is where Mittens used to be. This is where the, you know, he gave this whole like tour around it, around that. And then we ended up in a session and, and with Roy Brooks, you know, and these and wonderful musicians. So I got to, got to play with these guys and stuff. And then through that, through him, I met Max Roach, who was a, a great mentor for me as well. He was, he, you know, and, 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 it's, and it's great for the, that older generation who took care of us, who really had a stake in, in seeing the music move forward and having, having the next generation just being, I feel the same thing today. I feel to, that it's so important for me to have that relationship with younger artists too. You know, people people that make sure that they know there's someone there who would fight for them. Oh, that's beautiful. There's a, this theme of like the art, especially as like um, uh, a black person in this country, it's something that no one can take from you. It's something that you mentioned that's like it's given to you, like you know, you know come from above by God. And just gonna mention Wu Tang playing really quick. We're gonna get back to you know the classical music. But there's an episode last week where they're talking about um, when they created their music. Right. And then the visual of what it looks like to create is one of the most. If you create something, you can tell that they got it exactly right. The images that you see, the symbolism that in your head that you then kind of interpret through music. And that to me just looked like freedom. Right. That's the creativity that lives in your head when you're making the music, when you're playing the music, when you're writing the poem that no one else can really see. And that. As Black people, we've had to find liberation through so many different ways, but it's not always through systems. And so, Mr. McGill, Mr. Davis, can you talk to us about You Have the Right to Remain Silent? Talk to us about this piece. Uh, yeah, I'll let you get your mic well, while I just discuss a little bit of what it's <laughs> like being the performer of the work. Because what, that was a great segue to what you just mentioned, is that uh, what, what music has the capacity to do and and Orchestral music also has the capacity to do. That's why I love it. We love it. We love Phil, obviously, is that you can be transported to a different place than the place you are. So there, there, the, the there might be a little bit of cognitive dissonance when you're in a space like a concert hall, listening to an orchestra play, but you're able to be transported through music, like the music. Um, by, of Anthony Davis, which you'll hear next week, or which we're doing next week, is that um, I'm able to transport myself into a space that, that Anthony lived, you know, a real space. And, you know, we can talk about the, the movements of the piece to tell you where this journey happens. Um, but um, one of the, fir the first movement is, is called interrogation. We talk about these. The second movement is called loss. Yeah. Third is incarceration, and the fourth movement of this work is a twenty-five minute piece. Um, is called the dance of the other, and I'll I'll let you speak to the the journey that we we, we go on. But as the clarinetist, I'm the protagonist in really this uh, instrumental opera. So the sounds that you hear within the piece are uh, you can of course imagine what you want to imagine based on the titles of each part of the work. But um, in the sound of the clarinet and the orchestra and the speaking part of the actual random rights that you hear in, on the stage, you are able to relate to this experience, the experience of the other. You know, I'll let you, you know, talk a little bit. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I had this vision when I was, I was going to do this. I was commissioned to do a clarinet show and I was uh, for a chamber ensemble. And as an opera composer, I was used, used to dealing with, you know, a text, you know, a, you know, telling a story with music. So I was trying, I was having to go, I was trying to get into writing the piece, and I, and I thought about it. I said, well, well would it be interesting if I, if the relationship of the orchestra and the clarinet in the beginning is this, you know, the, the orchestra is interrogating the clarinet. The clarinet. It's as if the spotlight is on the clarinet player, and the he's 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 under the lights of the and, and the orchestra is making all these comments on and and he he has to res, he responds to it because concertos always have that call and response thing it's kind of a part of endemic to the form you know the you know the, the, 
solo solo the solo instrument is response to the orchestra and the orchestra response to the solo instrument. And so so I so, so that was sort of the beginning of my thinking of it. And then as I got into it, I began to get into the vulnerability of that, you know, and the, the clarinet being having this vulnerability. And then um, uh, the idea of also shifting material back and forth, musical material. Um, and then as I built up on it, and then the second move I realized I wanted I I needed electronics. I wanted to have this whole other electronic aspect to it. It was almost as if the electronics and my friend Earl Howard created electronics. It's almost like another orchestra. So that as that comes into the second movement and, we, and, and that that develops uh, out out of what was well, so the second movement. So the second was called Loss, and then and then you arrive at this melody. You know, that comes out that was really inspired by uh, the music of Charles Mingus. And Charles Mingus was a wonderful composer who, who was very inspirational to me. Uh, and because his music was so visceral, so powerful, and then he had such a strong message to say in his music. And uh, so I wanted to capture a little, a little bit of that, that, that world, you know, in, in it. So, uh, and that features the contra alto clarinet, which is uh, uh, a wonderful instrument that I think I've played in Cincinnati and Temple we played. And, and then, uh, then the third movement, I decided to do the whole thing with the, the incarceration, which was where I actually hear the whole Miranda, but from the percussionists saying the Miranda as they play. Mm. So it's like, like they, so, so I'm realizing also because. Part of, part of language, you know, what's interesting with text is that text has rhythm and speech rhythm. You know, like, well, what, 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 what are you doing with poetry? You know, it's all about all about the beat. <laughs> it's all about the rhythm. So I had this whole thing with, okay, you have the right to remain silent. You know, okay, well, how, how you know, how I write, and then other parts of it, and then interacting with the percussion as a back, and background to the clarinet and the and the, the synthes the synthesizer playing in spaces. So 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 that was that was the fun part. And then the fourth one was kind of a release from it, dance or the other, you know, so if, you know how you would feel on the other side. And uh, uh, Anthony plays it so beautifully, and I'm so excited to hear him play again. So, no, um, I just like to interject something. You uh, just listening to you talk just then, Anthony. I was I was given so. Uh, so many thoughts. Um, the conversation between the orchestra and the clarinet, it made me think about um, the poem that, uh, that's actually in Just Mercy that I will call on my tears because it's a conversation between the conscience and the tears. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't perform this live much, so I might mess up, but I want to share it with you guys. Um, it's very short. It says, Imagine teardrops left uncried from pain trapped inside, waiting to escape through the windows of your eyes. Why won't you let us out? The tears question the conscience. Relinquish your fears and doubts and heal yourself in the process. The conscience told the tears, I know you really want me to cry. But in releasing you from bondage, in gaining your freedom, you die. The tears gave us some thought before giving the conscience an answer. If crying brings you to triumph, then dying is not such a disaster. Uncrossed tears. <laughs> That wasn't planned, by the way. It was just something that was <laughs> so powerful, so moving. And while you were speaking, I was near. I was hearing. I was hearing his piece. Uh, uh, in my head, right? Uh, absolutely. I was hearing that piece. That word. I'm gonna collab. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. I, I was hearing the spirit of your work and your words, and I think that's the that is the beauty of art, is that we we've never met. We, we had never met before last year. And 
And there is a connection, there's a thread that goes through people together in the greater community. And I think um, that, that energy is something that art and music can do. It can connect people that have never met, that have had different experiences, and, have, and all of a sudden we're a part of what? We're a part of humanity. We see each other's humanity. I see your art in his art, and his art in your art, and your art, <laughs> and and your art, and your presence. And that's a very powerful, powerful place to be. It is. It is. It is. And, and the other thing that I was thinking about while you were talking, when you were talking, when you said you met, you met Duke Ellington, I literally just came back uh, from a trip. Uh, and I met so many famous people um, on the strip. Um, uh, how can I say? Every year, Amazon holds this private uh, thing, and they invite artists uh, if they if people recommend them to. So I was just hanging out with Jeff Bezos, mm-hmm. uh, the richest man in the world. I was just hanging. Uh, Lucy Liu was asking me for pictures with me after I left stage because no one knew who I was before I got on stage. But after I left the stage, it was like the whole event transformed around around me and my and my story was like so in the Bible. And I'm not uh, uh, you know of any particular religion, but it says your guilt shall put you before great men. And I just felt that uh, you know less than two weeks ago when I was in Arizona with 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 Lucy Liu and Allison Felix and. Jeff Bezos and Michael J. Fox. I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm world watching these people on TV. And now they're here asking me for this. Like, man, God will take you from the bottom to the top, you know? Mm-hmm. I just want to share that. No, that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. It, um, so, you know, as you all, you know, think about how your art, you know, we talked a lot, the internal changes that it has made. I'd love to hear more about, like, how you feel like your art can make, you know, external changes. And uh, Mr. McGill, I was um, researching you, and I saw that during the uprising last year, you basically did your own, you know, protest, you know, within your home, um, using your art um, by playing America the Beautiful. Could you talk a little bit about that and what that meant for you and what impact you hope that would have? Yeah, so um, after uh, the murder of George Floyd, woke up one morning and I started off the day uh, just, you know, just hurt, just hurting. And I, I actually started off with the written word. I wrote a statement about what I believe um, life and protest means in America as a black person, especially. And so I played America the Beautiful and went into a minor key at the end to show that America's not beautiful unless it's beautiful from the sea to shine the sea. Right, everyone. Yes, can you talk about and, people who don't know what it means oh, you went to a minor key? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I started off with America the Beautiful above. And then I changed one note and it, it got sad. <laughs> that was for me. <laughs> but really painful to demonstrate the pain that people were feeling in that moment, the pain I was feeling in that moment. And what I did is I made this video with these words and I challenged my fellow artists, musicians, people online. And I, I made a, a challenge to them to stand up and use their art and their power and their voice to speak for what's right in the world, for justice. And what happened was um, hundreds and hundreds of fellow classical musicians, amateur, professional artists, dancers, poets, and others that took that um, hashtag take two knees and 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 also wrote underneath why they they support justice in the world. Um, and um, the plight of, of black people in America. And it was an outpouring of in a community that was not necessarily known for its activism or speaking up about issues in the world. But I was able to use my platform as a musician in classical music um, and to, uh, frankly, a lot of arts organizations after that moment were um, also brought to uh, become aware that they could also say something 
about what's going on in the world in addition to presenting their art form. And it was a very powerful thing because I was doing it for a personal reason. But like you said, because of the platform that I had, the platform we had was arts organizations, um, even as the New York Philharmonic, for instance, um, to be able to, to team up with, with you all and everybody here, John Jay, to have this discussion even. It's a very, we have more power in the world than we know to affect change because uh, you mentioned you mentioned, as you know, to bring awareness to things through our art um, is also a very beautiful, beautiful way to use one's platform outside of the world. Not only for the personal enjoyment that we get from listening to music, but also because we can also connect different communities together um, with music as a prominent figure, but also in the background while we present and lift up people that need to be lifted up. Thank you, that's beautiful, Mr. Miguel. Mr. Davis, um, we talked about this a little bit before we started, but um, so last year with the racial uprising, I did see a lot of panels with like classical musicians, you know, talking about like the issues of race within some of these orchestras, which I was really shocked by. I was really happy. And I could also see that, you know, there was a little bit of nerves around having this conversation in the space of the orchestra and the operas and things like that. So I'm curious if you can share with us, do you think that this is a time where we're going to see like a, like a long-term change in the way in which um, uh, this genre like brings in, you know, more diverse audiences, puts on, you know, more diverse pieces? Do you think it's going to be a sustained change? That's the uh, million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, to be frank, but I don't know. I mean, I think that, um, you know, we have this window. Sometimes, and when the window opens, the door opens, we have to push through. We have to push through everything we can to push through and to make progress, to make 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 make, make our point. And I think uh, that there was a moment after George, George, what, what happened to George Floyd, where there was a moment where that, that's, that, that institutions became more aware of that they know that they need to have some responsibility and accountability and to also represent the community where that they serve. You know, and I think I think that, that I think that's been an all in all a very positive thing. Of course now we see a pushback. There's a pushback. There's a backlash. The bad backlash could be the discussion of critical race theory that's been raised by the, the American right, which you see is the beginning mm -hmm. of this kind of, of the white, I think the white backlash to to the opening up of, of our it's cultural institutions to, to this idea. And the fact that we examine our history and not whitewashing our history, mm -hmm. you know, and that means, for example, looking at the Tulsa Race Massacre, for example, mm -hmm. you know, was there been the number of television shows. I, I was I'm, I was writing an opera based on the Tulsa Race Master. And and uh, but also looking back at our past and the path, you know, our past is is beautiful and you know, we like America and the beautiful with Matthews, but it's there. But, but I think that we have to embrace its entirety mm -hmm. if we're gonna be healthy as a, as a nation. But if if we, we should go in the future with blinders on. And so I try to erase, you know, the you know the the racist past that America's been built on. I think that 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 would be that that would be heartbreaking and and, and disturbing because I think that means that we we haven't changed. We right. have we haven't wrestled with the demon, and we have to wrestle with the demon in order to be better as a people and order to also also to fulfill our promise as a country. I tell you what, Mr. Davis, anything you compose, I'm coming to sleep. As long as I you have a new fan, <laughs> I will be in the place. I don't know if it's time for question and answer yet, but now okay, we're good. So, Ian, can you also? We're talking about art, talking about liberation. Um, I also believe that healing, having a healing practice, is also a liberatory, you know, function. Mm -hmm. um, what is the connection you feel like? between your poetry and your journey through healing? Uh, good, good, tough question. <laughs> um, 
so like I said, poetry was a therapy for me. Um, it gave me, uh, first of all, you know, men look down upon and cry. That that is intensified growing up in prison. Like you can't show any type of uh, weak emotions uh, because it's it'll put you at a in a, in a vulnerable space to probably be preyed upon. So I was able to cry through my pen. I used my pen to shed tears. Um, and but you know the way I, I I was healing through it because that's the way I was getting out. And then to manifest, for example, I just left Indianapolis where Butler University put my book. They bought like 1,500 copies of my book um, and shared it as a community read instead of a common read because- What's the name of your book? Uh, my Time Will Come. My Time Will Come. Yeah, they shared it as a community read. Um, get around the political, the, the professor that brought me in said uh, uh, the provost was interested when she said community read, I mean, uh, common read, it's, I guess it's, uh, maybe you can speak to this, uh, uh, it's, it's political. If you use the, the, uh, the term common read, then it's a lot more red tape. You got to cut through with the, with the university or something, but they use uh, common read. And so I was able to go to Indianapolis. Uh, they had me for two days and they took me to halfway house uh, to speak with former, uh, to, to prisoners that had been, a release from prison, but had one more step to get out. And I shared with them and showed them, you know, how far I had came in five years. Uh, you know, I was released in 2016, uh, November 2016 to be specific. The only thing that I believe happened good that November uh, uh, in 2016. Um, <laughs> but after 26 years, um, and just to share my, you know, be able to share that and then to go and speak with faculty and students at the, at, at the university and have them just come up to me and just ask me to sign their books and follow me on Instagram. And it's like, hold on, what you're showing me now is totally different from what they tried to train me to believe about myself for 26 years, that I wasn't worth anything, that I didn't have anything of value to offer. And all of that, the accolades, the, the, the positive affirmations, all of that, is is the medicine that helps my heal? Because mm. your story is so powerful, and I wonder: Are you ever in conflict with like how you share or how people receive it? Because you're such a strong, like brilliant person. Like, do you find that sometimes people, you know, can can in engage with your story in a way that doesn't really um, respect the whole power of who you are? So, you know, in terms of like maybe fetishizing it or just, you know, being, you know, patronizing around it. Like, you know, how do you protect it, you know, to, in, when you share your story? There's a couple of things. So there's a mis, you know, there's a misunderstanding about the way the media at first uh, was portraying my story. Uh, it was portraying it in a way that was not exactly true. You know, my big movie became my friend. I usually, when I do my full presentation, and you know, I got the screen up. I'll show you this, uh, the Starbook series where so you can have a little bit more of the story. Uh, but they made it look like uh, I was free because someone forgave me. My, my friend, the big one, forgave me. Uh, that's not true. Had not Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice System uh, initiative appealed to the United States Supreme Court, wow. I would have died in prison. Wow. Um, the, despite the fact I reached out to my victim to ask for forgiveness and she forgave me uh, when I was 14 years old. Um, I would have died in, in, in prison. Um, another, you know, thing that I think uh, gets misconstrued is that uh, I was I was just I was releasing everything is all right. The reentry process is one of the most difficult and critical part of the criminal justice system, if you ask me. Uh, you know, people get stuck on what's going on inside the prison, which is much needed because like I tell people, like I told people during my CNN interview, if what happened to George Floyd happened in broad daylight, imagine what happens in prison walls when it's not being recorded, behind those closed doors. But the re-entry process is so pivotal because you take people who uh, get released with very little uh, skills. Um, and, and, and if you don't have the support of, of, of an equal justice initiative and a Brian Stevenson uh, we in society is extremely hard. It was still hard for me 
applying, trying to get an apartment to stay. Oh, you're a convicted felon. Uh, we don't want you here. Trying to get a job. Uh, we don't uh, know you got to hit a, a violent history. Uh, trying to open a bank account. When I first got out, I tried to open a bank account and I needed three forms of ID. I only had two forms of ID. It's just constant um, roadblocks and obstacles placed in your way repeatedly. So it takes a lot of uh, resilience. Uh, thank God God instilled that in me. Um, it takes a lot of fortitude. And it, it takes a lot of determination, not only to survive, but to thrive and say that, you know what, despite what I went through, I mean, I'm going to make it. I'm going to be successful. And, and I'll, I'm forever thankful that I I held on to my sanity and that my sanity and humanity and talent is still intact. Amen. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing You're that. Welcome. So, Mr. Davis, Mr. Miguel, um, do you have like a, a hope for what you hope people will get from this piece? You, um, you have already remained silent. Or is it just kind of like we put it out there and where people take, or do you go in creating saying, this is what I want people to understand? I don't think it's that didactic in the sense of, you know, compelling people to understand something. But what I think the overall thing is empathy. You know, the idea of communicating that the, the process of identify, identification that you are the player that player. Mm-hmm. You you are that you are and then you're going you're going going through and now that that's kind of metaphorically through sound that goes through through, through the sound. So that that is something that that Music does that. Uh, I think is so so important because it it it's, it, it intensifies that relationship of uh, that empathetic empathetic relationship between what the listener and the audience feels and what what what's being and feeling represented on stage. So so when I did my opera Malcolm X, for example, you know when I was composing, I was always thinking about. Uh, my, 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 I was identified with not the next course, but I think, think I want the audience, black or white, to identify with not the next that he's theirs too, that he represents them, and, and that his struggles are struggle. And that, that's, that to me, if you can, if you can bridge that gap, then you, then you've done something. You, you set up, you sit, you lit the match, and that hopefully that, that helps change, you know, change things in the future. I can't say it better than that. (laughs) Um, But uh, I think as a performer, that's what we want. That's what we try to do. That's what I find is give voice to to this character, that character on the stage. And that experience that I am going through with the orchestra, I guess. And also, that the character of the clarinet, in particular, this um, has an identity and is human. And this is, I think, as it's going, as this person, they are going through this experience as you will journey with with them on the stage. Is that they, they, you can relate to that experience that we try to place people over there. Although those are those people, and those are not people, and we try to separate ourselves from from, from other people generally. Uh, especially going through the situation of that piece, you have the right side, and there's so many different sides that are humans on on the sides on either side. The orchestra is made up of humans too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Miguel. So we're gonna wrap up, um, but before we do, Ian, what is the message that you will have for these wonderful honor students? as they go out into the world and hopefully go out and make it a more just world based on what you've been through, what is important for them to know or understand? Um, um, just a couple points. Um, one of the greatest thinkers of, uh, of the 20th century, Albert Einstein, said that imagination is more important than knowledge. Um, Martin Luther King said, if I can help someone as I pass along, if I could cheer someone with a word of song, if I could show someone that traveling wrong, then my living will not have been in vain. I think if you combine those things, man, and just believe in yourself and as you help others as you go along, people are going to tell you, you got to do it this way to be successful. 
people told me I, I wasn't going to make it out of the highest aspirations they had for me was to get out of solitary confinement. Ian, you're so smart. Why don't you just focus on getting out of solitary and being a teacher's aid? Mm. That was the highest aspirations that they had. Not, not, I didn't have that for myself, though. I had higher aspirations. And so now I'm being considered for a Grammy for my book. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank, thanks. I just want you guys to believe in yourself, man, and follow your dreams, and 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 stick up for yourself. And there's no one way to be successful. Wonderful. Here are some questions from the audience here, but let's just take a moment to give a hand to our wonderful panelists. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I learned so much from this conversation. I learned a tremendous amount from you. And Mr. McGill, Mr. Davis, I'm going to get myself to the Philharmonic. Go to some orchestras. I'm coming to see everything you composed, Mr. Davis. All right. So here's a question. I believe this question may be for you, Ian. Um, what would a concrete action plan toward creating rehabilitative centers rather than punitive prisons look like? So what would you... I know. So what would you want to see in terms of right now the prison system that you've experienced? It wasn't about rehabilitating anyone, right? So if you could reimagine what a, a prison center could look like, what would it be? What needs to happen? Well, one, for one thing, uh, you know, I have to speak to the issues that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, solitary confinement, I feel like no child should not. Uh, recently, I wrote a New York Times op-ed article uh, that was published in March of this year about solitary confinement. And right after that, they stopped uh, placing, um, they passed a law to stop incarcerating juveniles in solitary confinement. Uh, I want to see that throughout the United States of America. Um, because I was a child and I was placed in solitary confinement and I was kept there for nearly two decades. So I would, that's one thing I would love to see. Also, the age limitation uh to place an, uh, a child into adult prison. Uh, they, they need to not, a child should never be placed in an adult prison. If you have to be 18 years old to vote, you have to be 21 to drink, have to be a certain age to buy cigarettes, why not have a, a, a cap on a, the ability to place a child into adult prison? Like, I should have never been sent to adult prison with a life sentence at age 13. Mm -mm. And I know once I was um, watching something else that you were, um, another interview you did, and you were talking about in Florida, like the law is, I forgot how old children can be to be sentenced to no age. There's no age limitation. There's no age limit to how young a child can be to be sentenced to life in prison in Florida. That, yes. Florida always mentioned that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, exactly. Sorry about that. Um, so, how is your relationship slash outlook? How has your relationship slash outlook of the correction system changed in November 2016 upon release? How has it changed? Yes, yeah, it's when completing certain applications. Um, does the question have you been convicted of a felony make you? How does it make you feel? Well, it, it's a little different for me. I'm I'm getting ready to actually. Uh, applied for a job to work at City Hall. Um, and I'm actually... <laughs> uh, I, uh, I met the mayor, so it helped uh, with the process. But what about the, you know, the people that didn't meet the mayor or whatever? Mm -hmm. But it, I, I'm being seen as a person. Oh, oh you mean? <laughs> I'm being seen as a person, but it's a vigorous background check that goes on. Um, to try to work for the government. And like, I've been waiting three months. Uh, I actually quit my old job at Test and Trace. And, and, and uh, thankfully, I got I get speaking engagements all over the country to sustain myself. But uh, I've been waiting three months for the final approval of, of this job. Um, how has it changed? Moving to New York helped change the outlook because it's a lot more liberal. Um, had I still been in Florida or well, when I first got out, I went to Alabama um, with the reentry process. And uh, Alabama is a very, very, very red state. And um, that's where I was running into the problems with the reentry. New York's a little better, um, but there still needs to be changes. And I look to continue making those changes from City Hall. Wonderful. What part of Alabama were you in? Uh, Montgomery. Oh, okay. All right. So 
This as well as is a question I want to thank you all for motivating me to write again. Whoever said that, that's wonderful. Glad to be here. Got some more questions coming. Thank you so much. All right. Ian, what advice would you give a young person who recently got 25 to life? It's not over. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that kept me going is the fact that I visualized my life outside of the prison system. I mean, I was in prison physically, but mentally I kept envisioning that I'm going to get out one day. I'm going to I'm going to write a book. I'm going to uh, they're going to make a movie about my life. But in order for me to make a movie about my life, I just signed a movie, there, by the way. Uh, in order for me to get there. I have to survive this. Right. And, 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 and my, something my mom used to tell me as a kid just kept playing over and over in my mind. Ian, whatever you do, don't let them take your mind. Mm. Right? That was my final defense against the insanity that surrounded me. Right? And so to whoever that is that just got that 25 years, you got to believe that the impossible, I have a phrase that says the impossible is obtainable. And that those are man words. The man, it's easy to say you got life. You got 25 years and write it. Mm -hmm. But the same way, man, write it, it could be unwrote. I'm living proof. Mm -hmm. I'm living proof that it could be done. And it gave me life at 13 and said I'd never see society again. That I was going to die, that I was unfit to ever walk the streets of society. But here I am, man. 20, 26, 30 years later, I'm here with a sound mind, and I'm not going to stop until I reach and accomplish my dreams. Thank you so much. So, Mr. Davis and Mr. McGill, I would love to hear your response to this next question. And of course, Ian, too, we'll let them. So, um, how do you all feel about people who use the beautiful art of music to incite violence and destructive thoughts? Do you feel like this shift in music um, shines a bad look on all the overall advantages of using music? as a form to express yourself. So how do you feel about music that is um, incites violence or destructive thoughts? Um, I, I think that's probably not a good thing. I don't know exactly what the questioner is, is referring to specifically, mm -hmm. but um, I'm curious, I'm actually, I need to know that. I'm curious exactly what music they're talking about. I wish I knew. Because then I would say, if you mean that there are people that write music that depicts violence because that's the situation that they're growing up in or the situation they know in their life to express themselves. That's a little bit different mm -hmm. um, than what the question I think is leading leading us to answer. So yeah, I definitely don't support music that is, is trying to inspire people to commit violence. But when it comes to like certain types of music where people are expressing experiences in their own lives that they, they, they have seen expressed, and, and in places where they live. Um, I think that's okay. That's an okay expression of art. You know? So, I, so I, I'm, I'm filling in a couple gaps there, but I think that's where they're going. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Davis, do you want to respond? Yeah, well, it was, it, you know, sometimes- Oh, is it, was your question? Yeah. Was it answered in the right, is well, that what you meant? I was referring to with like music about um, like killing people, like wanting to, like, so there's this, I don't know the group, but they made a song about killing someone's brother, and they were making it seem like it was a good thing. You know, mm. you know, like they did something good. So glorifying violence. Yeah, so glorifying violence. Not talking about you know, the hearts of people. Too. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah. No, I, I, I see your point. I see your point, and that's something I, I have to, I have to think about because sometimes you unleash power in music that you don't realize that you're doing. And, and music has the potential to be constructive and destructive. So that, but, but the, because also you're dealing with the, the passionate thing, the emotional thing. Like uh, one thing that fascinated me, and is what what makes someone do think something is more valuable than a human life? What when you value something? So, uh, for example, when I did I did a piece that was uh, about 9/11. And, and what was weird about the piece, and the reason 
that it wasn't performed for 10 years was that, you know, it is that the second movement of the piece dealt with it from the point of view of the pilot who took over the plane. And that's not a point of view that's generally that people acknowledge. I was, I was curious about what makes someone do that. What makes someone do that? How does one get to that point that that, that you know, and, and I, I didn't think that it was an adequate or an accurate answer to say that they were cowards, you know, which, which was sort of our politically correct thing to say at the time. But, 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 but exam, sometimes you have to examine things that are, are disturbing, that's disturbing aspect, and art does that. Sometimes it's not all about being, you know, just, you know, uh, you know, just beautiful and, and pristine, but sometimes you're dealing with the, the, the disturbing nature of what, what we feel and what, what, what affects us. And, and to, to me, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, Malcolm X always said that uh, in America, violence is as American as apple pie. Okay. So, 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 in, in telling the story, because when I did my opera, X like Todd Malcolm X, I, I was always like, I realized there's this undercurrent, this thing, this momentum, this, and as I say, almost the demon inside us and inside our society that makes us do things, you know, that, and that that we ride it and we try to control it, but maybe we can't control it all the way. And and so so so, but that's something that that's what makes something tragic. I mean, and sometimes those are uncomfortable emotions, uncomfortable situations. But that's something that that in art and in, in, in creating something cathartic and something that you go through, you have something to go go through the pain and understand it. And I mean, and Ian, what Ian, Ian has said so much is is how much how much he did that in his art. And I think that 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 helps it's helped us understand and 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 feel what 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 what's going on so 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 that's what you're saying is a complex question it's a complex question because um we don't we don't want to make art just anesthesia you know by a narcotic art can't be just a narcotic something you take so that you that that those uncomfortable feelings go away that's not what art's supposed to do art's supposed to illuminate it reveal it let you go through it and 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 have a cathartic experience with it. Hey, that's a great note for us to end on. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Anthony McGill. Thank you, Anthony McGill. Thank you, Anthony McGill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Robin Walker-Murphy, for moderating the panel. Yes. Great moderator. Great moderator.